Uh, this morning, we will take back up in our study through Peter's first epistle. So if you will turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. On my vacation, I spent much time meditating and praying over chapter 1, and I, I'm just praying that these truths are getting deep into our heart and into our souls. I believe that they will be sufficient for everything we need for life and godliness. They are the gospel. So what I want to do this morning is what some of you were afraid of, is I think we need a good review because it's been a while, but then I woke up and remembered it was Communion Sunday. So I'm going to give you a brief review. And we're going to start with chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, the the great apostle Peter, who has the world's famous uh, denial of Jesus Christ, and he's been restored by Christ. Now he's writing to the church that's suffering greatly. There's persecution, and it's about to break open uh, with Nero and the things that will take place upon believers very shortly from the beginning of this epistle. So in 1 through 12, Peter wants to remind them then of their great salvation And he reminds them that you're chosen. You might not be the choice of the world, but you are God's choice. And he has chosen to dispense all of this grace and salvation and mercies upon you. It is the free gift of God. And then Peter begins worshiping in verse 3 that God in his mercy caused us to be born again when we were dead in sin and trespasses. It was God who said, let there be life. He gave us life and we responded with faith. But God caused us to be born again to what? To a living hope. And now we have hope, he says, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so now our hope is seated at the right hand of God, that he completed victory. We will go and follow right where Jesus is now. And so we have this blessed hope in verse 4. We have an inheritance that's imperishable and undefiled. It will not fade away. So we live with that hope. Our eyes, our journey, everything is toward that. And God uh, takes us and puts us in the fire and protects us by purifying our faith. So the way he protects us is not just this little hedge that no one can touch you, but he he lets many things come into your life, but he's going to protect you by giving you a faith that will never die. And he will keep sticking in a furnace, and he'll purify it, and he'll boil off unbelief and impurities in our life to get this pure gold that believes this gospel and trusts, and the outcome of it will be the salvation of your eternal soul. And then he comes and says, this salvation is so great, it's not new. The prophets spoke of it, and they would prophesy and go back and study and say, who is this Christ that we're prophesying of? When will he come about his sufferings and the glory to follow? And he says, it's such an amazing salvation that the angels have epithumias. They have over-desires to look and gaze at the salvation that we have this morning. Peter is saying, be overwhelmed with the grace of God. Any trial that you've walked in here with this morning, let that gospel overwhelm it. Let it just put it in its right place. Let the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of this glorious salvation that God has procured for us in his son. Then we looked at the response in verse 13, a therefore. What is it therefore? Here's the gospel. Here's how you live out of gospel truth, and he tells us you need to have a right heart now towards God as a born-again child of God. You need to, to hope with finality. Quit hoping in anything but the coming to you grace of God in Jesus Christ. Quit putting hopes in lesser things that die and don't come about. Put your hope in that. Because he's holy, be holy. Set your lives to be consecrated and lived for God because of this gospel and live in fear because of what God did to get rid of your sin was punish his own son on a cross. So have a right heart towards God and hope and holiness and fear. Secondly, then, have a right heart towards others. We looked in uh, chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. You need to have a love. I love that Greek word. It just stretches out, out, out. A muscle, a runner stretching every spiritual muscle that he has running for the kingdom of God. So as you sit here this morning, are you stretching in your love with anybody? Is it just, are you like unbelievers and you love those who are nice to you? This is the call. The gospel will set you free to be born again now to love and it's, a, it's an agape love that will just give and sacrifice and deny and stretch because of the one who stretched for you on a cross. 
Thirdly, you need to have a heart towards the word of God. Peter just wraps this up so nice. The gospel, have a heart towards God, have a heart towards others, and have a heart towards the word of God. This morning, we will see that in verses one through three. Let me actually read that for you. Verse one, therefore, <clears throat> putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. As we journey this epistle, we're going to see how to manifest this salvation to those who are disobedient to the word of God. And so this morning, uh, I want to pray and ask God to give a thirst in every believing heart for this word of God that you might grow in respect to salvation. I, I pray that he would wake us up from apathy uh, in 1 Peter 2, 9, he, he says that you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness unto his marvelous light. And in verse 8, he says that uh, they stumble because they're disobedient to the word. That, that Greek word is apatheo. And so the unbeliever is just apathetic to the word of God. And the believer is like a newborn babe thirsting and longing for it that I might grow up in respect to salvation. And so the unbeliever is apathetic to this word. And the believer, these are the nourishment and the words of life from God. So this morning, I, I'm asking God that everyone in this room thirsts for the word of God. So let's go before him and ask that he would do that very thing through his word by the power of his Holy Spirit. Father, we come before you and what I ask no man can do. So we come before the God who art in heaven. The God who hallowed be your, your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we put you, we, we put our minds and ascribe to you glory. God, we acknowledge that you are the one who can change and transform lives. And we thank you that you've given us such a precious gift uh, in the word of God and the word of God in Jesus Christ. And so I pray, Lord, that as we open these words, your spirit now would illuminate them to the minds of believers God, I pray that we would see the beauty and the glory in them and that, that you would cause a greater thirst in every heart for this word. God, forgive us. Forgive us that we have these, these, these Bibles and they sit oh, way too often, too much. God, forgive us. Have mercy on us that you've given us the words of life and we don't eat them and devour and treasure them as we should. God, would you do a mighty work in our midst this morning? We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, this morning we're going to see that Peter's going to exhort us to grow in respect to salvation. If you'll just look at 1 Peter 2.2, 2, he says that you might grow in respect to salvation. He, he wants us to grow up in our faith. We, we spent five weeks on, on how do we get that faith, studying the Reformation, now, how, how do I grow in that gracious, God-given faith in Christ alone for his glory alone? How do I now grow up? We need to grow. Have you ever said that to your kids? Just grow up. That's what Peter's telling you here this morning. We need to grow up. So as we begin, I want to address a problem of unbelief, the sin that so easily entangles us and encumbers us in Hebrews 12, and it's called spiritual fatalism. I heard the term uh, this week by John Piper, and I like it, spiritual fatalism. And fatalism is a word many of you might be familiar with. It's when you say that God is sovereign, and all I do is sit back and do nothing. If he's sovereign, we don't have to do anything, and we throw out man's responsibility, and we say it's fatalistic. Well, spiritual fatalism is a belief of feel, feeling that you are stuck right where you are spiritually, this is how God made me. I'm just always going to be this way. You become fatalistic and quit believing that you're going to grow through your sins in the areas that you're battling this morning. I haven't grown for 25 years. This is as far as that train is going to go until I die in sanctification. All this talk about love last time we were in Peter, I'm just getting further and further away from it. I'm never going to love the way Jesus has called me to. It's just how I am. My whole family's this way. I love that trump card. It's just who we are as a family. I'm Italian. I'm Latino. I'm just hot-tempered 
and I'm always going to be that way. I'm German. Germans don't have open hearts. I, I visited Berlin. There might be truth to that one. <laughs> I'm laid back. I'll just never desire the word like this passage is calling for this morning, Pastor. And, and I just want you to hear that that is spiritual fatalism. That is spiritual fatalism. It's just tragic. And I'm going to ask for a sh- I would ask for a show of hands how many of you are there this morning, but I'm afraid how many might go up. And verse 2, we're called to grow in respect to salvation. The whole Bible calls us to be growing in our faith, to be being changed from one image of glory to the next. Romans 12 says we're to be metamorphosed into the image of Jesus Christ. So God tells us plainly in Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you, he will complete it. He promises that by his sovereign hand and his sovereign power. So what have we learned in Peter is that you're protected by the power of God through faith being refined and purified. God will keep growing your faith, strengthening it, and moving you along. He will put you in trials that will bring about more faith and more of Christ, and he will do that in your lives. So please hear this this morning. This is a lie from the devil that you are stuck and you cannot grow anymore. Quit believing that, okay? I want to jump in your face this morning and just push. You can't believe that. That's a lie. Quit, quit buying into that. I'm done growing. This is just who I am. Peter says we are not stuck or God's a liar and he's a deceiver. We are not stuck. His power is not enough. He can't overcome our sin and our weakness and our apathy. You can speak a world into being. You can take death and give life, but you can't sanctify me. God has determined and set his name at stake that he will grow you and he will finish the work that he began in you. You need to think with the victor's mindset that we're dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. A fatalist doesn't crave the word of God that he may grow in respect to salvation. Here's how you'll know if you're a fatalist. You've quit going to the word. It doesn't work. It doesn't help. And you'll, you'll become fatalistic. I'm just kind of holding on for glory. That's all I care. I just want to make it to the end. And you have no determination in your heart to keep growing and being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. I believe that God uses this word to show me Christ and all of his glories and all of his beauties, to change me. It's to change you. Seeing, beholding, is becoming with Christ. I have a dear brother, uh, Nick, and at one time at a Bible study, he shared a poem that he memorized years back that John Bunyan wrote, and it's about law and gospel, and I want to read it to you and explain it And then we'll dig into our passage before us this morning. But I I think it's worth setting that. We've got to be set free from our spiritual fatalism. He says, run, John. Run the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. And it's just so beautiful. I just want to flush it out, and then we'll look at the passage. The old covenant gave you commands from Moses, from God. And there was nothing wrong with the commands. They revealed the character of God. The law gets a a bad rap sometimes. The law revealed the character of God. But the ability to keep the law since the fall of Adam was not given under this covenant. Just an elaborate system for ritual cleansing when you failed. And so the law gave us neither feet nor hands. It didn't give you the ability to do it. We are duty bound to run, but we can't run. You ever had those dreams where you you can't run and someone's chasing you? I I, I might be the only one, but it's weird. (laughs) And that's what the law does is you just can't run. Your feet won't move. They won't work. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. You're a spiritual corpse. We were condemned by the curse of the law. The soul that sins must die. But better news the gospel brings. It it says fly and it gives us wings. The gospel gives greater commands like the Sermon on the Mount. Don't murder. I say don't even get angry. It comes higher. It it calls for agape love in 1 Corinthians 13 and all of these things. It, It calls for a higher standard. But it bids us fly 
And it gives us the Holy Spirit as wings to go and fulfill this new law of Christ. Isn't that what we learned last time in Peter, that you've been born again so that now you can love? So this is it. It, it, you're born again, you're made new so that now you can live. He gives you wings to fly. You can't be settling with just being an inchworm crawling around on the ground, a little caterpillar. He gives you wings and this gospel to fly and to go live this new life in Jesus Christ. So the gospel gives deliverance from spiritual fatalism. Are you bent on flying? Do you long for the word of God? Don't settle until this love burns in your heart and your life. Don't become a fatalist in this area. I'm going to fight you for it. I love what Augustine said. He said, God grant what thou commandest and command what thou wilt. He bids us fly and he gives us wings. If God commands love, he gives us wings to go love in this gospel. If God says long for the pure milk of the word, he says fly. Go thirst for it and drink it up. May God put to death every heart this morning that has a spiritual fatalism. Okay, that's your introduction. Let's dig in. 1 Peter 2.1. I felt that was necessary. I hope that I stepped on some toes and they're sore and you're like, I'm ready to run. I'm, I, I, I slipped into that and didn't even realize I did it. All righty. Verse one, therefore, what do we do with that? That's a bad chapter break. It's very unfortunate. It breaks up something that was meant to be joined together. So what is it there for? Well, it's building a conclusion or an argument or a deduction from what has been previously said. The question is, what's been previously said? Well, in verse 22 through 25, you've been born again by a seed. This seed was called the gospel, called the word of God. And it was sown in your heart, and the Holy Spirit caused it to give birth to you spiritually, and now you're alive. And Peter says you're birthed to love fervently, to love from the heart. To love sincerely. How do I know if I've been birthed? There's a new love that I've never known or experienced that is growing in me from God. And this word is imperishable. It's a truth that will remain forever, the word of God. Our glory, Peter says, it comes and it goes and it fades and it withers. But the glory that's been revealed to you in this word is everlasting. And so now we have a command. Not, and it's, it's a lot like everything. This, notice this pattern that Peter's been building. Do you remember in verse 13 of chapter 1, there's one command, all these participles. The one command was hope. And verse 15, one command, be holy with modifying phrases. Verse 17, conduct yourselves in fear. Main verb, modifying phrases. Verse 22, one verb, fervently love modifying phrases, and now this morning, here's your main verb, long for the pure milk of the word. And everything else in one through three are gonna be these phrases just modifying this main command. And so the main command is you are to long for the pure milk of the word of God. So therefore, if this imperishable seed gave you life, a life of love, this word will now transform you and grow you into a life of love, into a life of conformity to Jesus Christ. So this word birthed you, and this eternal word will grow you, and it will sanctify you. This word will do that under the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to look first at this command and then the modifiers. So here's your outline this morning. The first thing we're going to look at is the principle. And then in verse 1, we're going to take a look at the prerequisite. And then verse 3, we're going to look at the, uh, the primer or the primer. And we'll, we'll explain those as we go. So let's look at the first point in verse 2, the principle. The principle is like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word. So that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. So long for the pure milk of the word of God. The definition for long is intense desire to insatiably thirst a strong craving. It's, it's a passion that cannot be quenched. And you know what the word is because we've seen it twice in Peter. What do you think it is? Epithumia. Here, here's that word again. Peter loves this thing. 
The third time here, and thumia is desire, epi is over. It's when you have an over-desire. So desires are good. When it becomes an over-desire, it becomes more than God in your heart. So here it is. He uses it positively. You are to have an insatiable thirst, craving, desire, epithumia for the word of God. In verse 12, the angels have an epithumia to look into the gospel Verse 14, don't be conformed to your former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance. Your epithumia is when you're an unbeliever and you live for the, all those lusts and desires. He says, you're done with that. Don't be conformed to those. But now, have an epithumia for the word of God. This has to be a strong passion within us. You don't play with the word of God and say, I think I might have a quiet time once or twice. This is a passion. We should want this more than our necessary food. We should want this the way a greedy man seeks after money. Have you ever seen a greedy man seek after money? They're up all night, all hours, checking their accounts. It is a passion. Should be like a glutton going after apple strudel. Is that too soon? <laughs> That's bad. It's like an idol idolatrous desire for a spouse. I've seen these young guys, it's all they can think about. And it's, it's, it's just such an epithumia, and it, it just goes into every facet of life. It runs through every strand. Uh, a parent's desire for the salvation of a child, that's a good desire. And when it becomes an epithumia, it controls you, and you're falling apart, and you're dying, and, and it's controlling you. But that mindset, think through the way you feel that for your child, that's the word here. I remember, this might be a bad illustration. I think I used it before, but when my son, because we got so many young kids in here, my son, when he was little, we bought him these little Winnie the Pooh, little plastic things. And he, I don't know why, but Winnie the Pooh became it for him. And he always wanted Winnie the Pooh. And in case you didn't know it, my oldest son is really strong-willed. And if, if, if he wanted something, he, you couldn't get it out of his mind. I mean, I could offer candy. Here, if we lost poo, I could say, here's some candy. What about Grover? What, you know, and you'd offer everything and nothing could turn that kid's mind. And it, he'd just go around going, poo, poo, <laughs> poo. And, I, and literally, I would just sit and go, that is an unbelievable epithumia. <laughs> and I just want to get to where whatever you offer me, all I say is, the word of God, the word, the word of God. I just want the word of God because in it, it reveals Christ. Give me an epithumia for this word, O oh God. I'm just going to read a couple from Psalm 119. It captures the heart of this so much. Just listen to these verses. Verses 9 through 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. With all my heart I have sought thee. Do not let me wander from thy commandments. Thy word I've treasured in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's how a young man can keep his way pure. And verse 18, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from thy law. Verse 20, my soul is crushed with longing after thy ordinances at all times. My soul is just crushed with a longing for your word, God. And verse 33, teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may observe thy law and keep it with all my heart. Make me walk in the path of thy commandments, for I delight in it. Verse 97, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. 112, I've inclined my heart to perform thy statutes forever, even to the end. And 133, establish my footsteps in thy word. And do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man, that I might keep thy precepts. Make thy face shine upon thy servant, and teach me thy statutes. My eyes shed streams of water, because they do not keep thy law. I love this word, and I'm longing after it. I'm crushed, and I want to obey it. I'm, sh I'm shedding streams of water, because I don't perfectly keep thy law. That's, that's epithumia kind of stuff. But I think I like Peter's illustration even better. He says it's like a newborn babe, like a nursing baby, 
thirsting after uh, its mother's milk. When a baby is born, what does it do? It, it cries, and what is it crying for? I just want to get home to that blue little room that my dad just painted and the crib and the little football that's waiting for me. No, all I want is one thing. I want milk, milk, milk. There's nothing else that can satisfy that little one. Praise the Lord because I didn't have any and I could sleep during the night when he wanted it. (laughs) Don't ever, young guys, don't ever let your wives give them bottles. You will have to join in. We just call that wisdom, and I love you guys. I want to help. (laughs) He or she will cry and cry until they're satisfied with milk. And that's what Peter wants us to be. I, I want you to be that way for the word of God. He says, long for the pure milk of the word. The word pure means without deceit or falsehood. It's an interesting, in, in verse uh, 1, there's a word, uh, delon, which means deceit. And he says, put that off. And now the word has adalon, which is without deceit. And so he, here, here it is, long for that that doesn't have any deceit. Don't you get tired of living in a world where everyone deceives? And he says, come to this word that has no deceit. It's just pure, pure. It means absolutely pure. It cannot deceive you. There's no capacity for wrong. Uh, It's truth. It's perfect. It's God's word. It's objective, perfect truth. It reveals God and his salvation, all that he's doing. We have that. Why would we spend our time reading these other things? Like, here is the word of God. Long for it. It's the only place in this world that we can come and find absolute truth. It is so refreshing to me. And so we should have an epithumia for the word of God. To feed on this pure, unadulterated word. Don't let anything else satisfy you. I'm telling you, if all you listen to is talk radio, you're not going to grow in respect to salvation. Don't replace it with TV and movies and music lyrics and CNN and newspapers and social media. Don't spend all your time on social media. Nothing else can do what the Word of God does. It's not rocket science. Some people read the Bible for all the wrong reasons. You can read it just because it's tradition. Our family always read it, so I read it. You can read it superstitiously, a scripture day keeps the devil away. You can read it educationally, I just want to be prideful and get more knowledge than other people and bring it out like a sword. I want to read it denominationally so I can prove something. I want to read it professionally to teach a lesson. I want to read it inquisitively to find all the secrets. How should I read it, Peter says, like a hungry baby to draw out nourishment to feed your very soul. I read it as a dying man. Feed me, nourish me, give me truth. I read it like that. Well, let me ask you this. What is it that it can do for you? Why should we thirst for it? Why should we live in the word like this? Why should we do what what Paul commanded? Let it dwell richly in us. Why should we be like a tree planted by the water that in the word he meditates on it day and night? Why should we be like that? Look in verse 2. There's a reason that by it, this word, thirsting and drinking it, you might grow in respect to salvation. This word for grow is in the passive. So you're to be active in your longing for the word of God, but God is the one who's going to grow you. It's passive. God will grow you through this word. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, and God caused the growth. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so here it is, guys, that when you're saved, God is going to grow you. And this is, this is the journey, and, and I've had, we've got like seven baptisms coming up, a lot of new believers, so I want to draw this chart for you. When you're first saved, there's this initial sanctification where God sets you apart, and you are holy positionally now before him. And then there's this ultimate sanctification that when you die, you're going to be made perfect. And so right now, your position is perfect, but your practice isn't. And your whole life is trying to get your practice to get up here to match your position. And so you go three steps forward, two back. It's this whole journey. But that's what we're looking at here this morning is the Word of God will cause you to grow. And one day you're going to die and your position and practice will be made perfect. 
But until that day, I am seeking to get my practice to my position. And the, re- the way I will get there is the Holy Spirit working through the word of God as I thirst and drink. I will grow in respect to salvation. And so what is that going to look like? What is our context? What are we growing in? I'm just going to read a couple verses and then we'll go back into the context. Paul in Colossians 1, we proclaim him, Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we might present every man mature, complete in Christ. So we teach that word, we feed it, we sow it, insatiably thirst that you might grow and we might present you complete. Ephesians 4.13, we preach so that they will attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure and the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. We are being built up into Christ. And in our context, you've been born again to love fervently. That is to be like Jesus Christ who fulfilled the law perfect. So if I am growing and maturing in my faith, it doesn't mean that my skirt's getting shorter and all these other things necessarily. What it means is I am growing how to love God and love others, and he will manifest that to love others fervently. This is what we are to grow up into. This is the context of where Peter's exhorting. This is what it means to be like Christ. Just think about what Christ was like. He surprises you. <clears throat> he had virtues that, that have never been seen before. I love reading the Gospels. He, he had a tenderness with no weakness. He had a strength to him with no harshness. He had a humility, but without, he never lacked self-confidence in God. He had a holiness, but an approachability. He had a passion without prejudice, an integrity without rigidity, and a moral glory and an absolute beauty. He he was love incarnate. And God wants us to grow up into that through his word that reveals him. He wants us to feed on his word. And I just want you to think about how you eat your food. And I want you to picture eating a steak. You cut it up. And that's studying the word of God. And then you taste and you chew it and you turn it over and you meditate and you let it melt your heart and you pray over it. That's why I keep saying, First Peter, go meditate on it, pray over it, get it in. And then thirdly, you swallow and digest it and it becomes part of you. It becomes your way of thinking, how you respond deep into the psyche of your life. The truth begins. It's, I don't even have to think a lot of how I respond in righteousness. It's, it's ingrained. And so take that word, cut it up, taste it, swallow it, meditate. And why do we not desire the word of God the way we should? I I bet everyone in here would agree with what I said. But is everyone reading it and thirsting for it the way you should? Why do we not desire it then as we ought? Why why do we not love people the way we should? Why why do we get into spiritual fatalism and think we're never going to grow because we haven't for so long. And I want to look at the, something that's going to help us this morning. Is Look in verse 1, our second point. The principle is to thirst for the word of God. There's a prerequisite, though. And I want you to look with me in verse 1. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and slander, put it aside. Something has to be put off before you can put on. Ephesians 4, the whole chapter, put off the old and put on the new. Put off speaking falsehood and put on speaking truth. Put off stealing and put on working so you can share with others. Put off unwholesome speech and put on speech that edifies. And so what do you, what do you guys notice about the sins in verse 1? Does anything jump out as you look at that list? Is there anything in, in verse 1, just as you kind of read those, that maybe brings them all together? Their, their appetite suppressants, if we're going to hunger and thirst for the word of God, these things will suppress appetite. And I want you to see that all of them are about self. Every one of them are s- sins of self. They're the hangover from being an Adam. And that is what keeps us from loving the way we are being commanded. I have a new nature that wants to love like this. But I've got remaining sin that is fighting me, attacking me, wanting me to think about myself more, fight others because they stepped on self's toes. There, there is the battle with self that is keeping you from this kind of life. And so what is uh, in the way of us loving like this, because we all want to, is that you need to be born again 
to love. You should want to grow in your salvation, to grow in this. When you're a kid, didn't you always want to be older? We had a funny family. We had seven boys. So the poor one right in the middle, there's the three older and the three younger. And the three younger wanted the middle and the three older didn't. And he wanted the older. He didn't want the younger. Can you see the dilemma in the family? And so he always wanted to be with the older ones. He wanted to be older and grown up. And I, I think that's what we should all want to be is I, I want to be growing. I want to, I want to grow up. I want to mature. I have flesh. We, we have a world that everything in this world is built on self. And we have a devil who is self-incarnate. He's a murderer and he's selfish. So you've got flesh, world, and devil that are all leading you to self. So they, they, they all deceive us into self-love and a self-preoccupation. So that's why we're in this battle where I can't just read a command and everybody go live it. It's there, there's a battle with self going on here. So I need the Word of God. I need true things that aren't deceptive to come into my mind why these three sources preach deceptive things at me all day long. So I need the Word to transform me and my thinking if I'm going to grow. And so I need to put off the old patterns of sin, the, the, what I was in Adam, the ways that I thought. So I've got to get rid of these things and put them off from what I used to be when I was an unbeliever. I need renewal. I need transformation. So the question is, what are we to put off? And here's the list, and all self. First, put off malice. The Greek word is wickedness. It's caused by bitterness to other people. So there's a, a bitterness towards others, and you will act wicked toward them. You'll, you'll have malice. Guile, the Greek word meant to catch with a bait. So to throw out a little bait, guile means to be deceitful, to trap other people to advance yourself. I literally spend you know, all my day just trapping everybody so that I'll look good and advance myself. That's guile. Hypocrisy, the Greek word meant to put on a mask, to try to be something that you were on the outside that you weren't on the inside. And so this is our, our battle is we're, we're hypocrites and we just want to put on a show instead of getting this real true godly love that will come from the inside to the outside through the word of God transforming us. So hypocrisy, put it off. Paul, Paul says in Romans, don't love with a hypocritical love. Be, be done with hypocrisy. Put off envy. That's desiring for self. Uh, any, anything that someone else has that's good, I want it for me. I can't be happy for anybody who is better at something, excels more. A anyone who does more than me, I can I just rejoice and love it? Can, can we love someone who can teach the word of God better because Christ has put on better display? All these battles with envy, put it off. And the last one is slander. It, it, it really means what the word sounds like. Katalalea, katalalea, katalalea. You're just always running your tongue. You're always mouthing off and speaking to put others down to elevate yourself. This is what is keeping you from loving all this self-focus, and it just puts everyone else down and slanders them and, and is mean towards them and, and has guile and all of these things. Peter says you're going to have to put off the sins of self if you're ever going to love this way, to long for the Word of God. And so uh, self will deceive, but the Word of God can't. It's without deceit. And so we don't want to advance uh, self, but we want to advance Christ. Christ exalted in this world, not us. We don't look out for our own interests, but others. So uh, I don't feel like reading. I, I want to watch this movie tonight. I want to go out with this friend. All, all of these things of self are going to have to be put off if I'm going to get in the Word of God and let it have its way with me and grow me up to become a lover like God is calling us to be as children of God. So I need help. I'm prone to think about myself. And this is my battle all day long. You got something for me, Pastor? <laughs> all you've done is condemned me. I, I can't do this. And so I, I leave you with some help. I, I want to give you some beautiful help. And that's our principle, thirst for the word. Prerequisite is put off these sins of self. And now the primer in verse 3. And so you put the primer on for help. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. This is what's called a first class condition in the Greek. And 
It really is, a, it, it's a statement of fact. It's a better translation is since you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Thirst for this word since you've tasted the kindness of God. Guys, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where I've seen people never grow. And I want, if you've been sleeping, I want you to wake up and maybe hear this. The reason you have never grown in your Christian life is you've learned the, the, the word, you've learned, you've taken doctrinal classes, Bible college, and all you did was get meaner. It got, you got meaner. How do you study the word of God and get meaner? And just became more critical. All the sins just kept growing in them. You're not growing in respect to salvation. Then you become a spiritual fatalist and you say, I'll never grow. This has to be answered with honest, judgment day honesty right here. When this word goes from just being mere words, where it's just a book, a creed, or a doctrinal statement, it has to go from that. And when 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12 breaks into your heart, and you get it. That's why I've been praying on it and meditating on it. When you get it, they're not just doctrines anymore. This isn't an academic book anymore to learn your systems and sharpen your swords to go stab people. Though all of a sudden it becomes my story of a God who chose me, of a God who gave me life when I was dead in my trespasses and sin, of a God who joined me to Jesus Christ as one. And now it changes everything about it. And when I read those, you know what they are to me? The kindnesses of God. I can't read 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12 without just marveling at the kindness of God to me in Christ Jesus. And even my sins have been paid for. This whole book becomes a story to you of the kindness of God when it becomes personal like that. And, and if, it, if it never has happened, you haven't been born again. And some of you may be in that predicament this morning. You're just getting meaner and meaner as you get older. Has this gospel broke in? Is it a story of the kindness of God toward me? Not towards others, toward me in Christ Jesus. Until that happens, your love will always be hypocritical, I promise. You'll fake it. You'll talk bad about everyone in this body when you're away from them. You don't see needs, and you'll never sacrifice to meet a need in this body. I'm not my brother's keeper. You'll never confront a brother in sin or sister. You won't pray for anyone truly. You'll tell them. This is the most important question to ask yourself. Is this gospel to your heart the kindness of God? Have you tasted of it? Has his kindness led you to repentance? To want to put off all of these sins of self is the only response. So badly that you long for the means that God has given the word of God so you can grow up into Christ and love like he did. I want to walk the way Christ walked. I want to get in this word and I want it to change me and make me that way. We love because he first loved us. That's the whole gospel. When I see the kindness and taste it, don't you want others to taste it? You can't taste how good this is and then ignore everybody else. It is so good, I want you to enjoy the kindness of God. It will cause you to love. It motivates and empowers me like nothing else to grow into my salvation. This book has to become my letters from a God who loves me and gave himself for me. It then grows love to him and love to others. It begins to put to death the deeds of the flesh. By the power of the spirit that walks within me, I can walk in the spirit and begin to put off these sins of self because of the kindness of God that I'm finding in this word again and again and again. How sweet is that? Well, now we get to come to the table and remember the sweetness of God that he would give his own son for, to make his wretch, to make a, a wretch his treasure. So let's, let's all now, we'll come together. I'm going to pray, uh, and then we'll spend time getting our hearts ready. And just what a privilege this is 
to join shoulders and faith and hands and, and to remember the Lord Jesus Christ and to really uh, ask, do I thirst for this word that reveals this Christ and his kindness and his goodness to me? And is it causing the sins of self to be put off? Are the sins of self just growing and percolating and taking over your whole life? The answer is Jesus Christ. And let's go to him and pray now. Father, I thank you that you so loved this world that you gave your only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, I pray for those who all the Christian life has done has made them bitter. It's made them snarky. God, it's made them where they just are, are growing old and weary and frustrated because it has never changed anything about them. And it's simply because this letter is not a letter about the kindness of God. And so I pray, Lord, if it needs be that you would open some eyes right now, that you would unstop some ears and give stony hearts fleshy hearts, and that they would see 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12 as the kindness of God to them, that it would overwhelm them, Lord, that your spirit would take over and through this word it would begin to cause them to grow in respect to salvation, which what that will look like is one who will love with a fervent love. For, for the brothers and sisters and for this world. God, I pray don't let them run away from this. Let them do business this morning with you. God, I pray there's a remedy for people in this place. And next week, the remedy is coming to him as to a living stone. Oh God, the glory of present tense coming to Jesus Christ again and again. Lord, let them, let all of us See the beauty that it is Christ who will produce this. This word reveals Christ. And as we see him and love him and coming to him, Lord, we will become these kind of men, women, and children. And so I, I pray that everyone in this room would thirst for this word that reveals you. God, I pray that it would no longer just be set aside and be a, a fourth thought of the day. God, let us make this the priority of our life to meet with you and drink from your kindness in the word of God. Lord, I thank you now as we come together to remember you at this table. And it's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen.